and welcome back to the analyst of Vaji Ram and Ravi. Today is 20th of October and these are the following articles that we shall be covering in detail. In the first one, we will build awareness around cyber crimes in light of the Operation Chakra 2 conducted by CBI across 11 states of India. In the second article, we will analyze the case of corruption in India in light of the growing pending prosecutions that have been highlighted by the DOPT data. In the third one, we will cover a silent but potent threat that is nanoparticle pollution in India. In the fourth one, we will read about the Rafa crossing that has gained political momentum across the world. And the fifth one, we will read about the regional rapid transit system that is Namo Bharat to be inaugurated today. So let's get started. Our first topic is about the cyber crimes in India. Here we will read about the different type of cyber attacks and what can be the prevention strategies. Now, what is the context that CBI under its Operation Chakra 2 has recently cracked down about 76 locations across 11 states of India as a part of its Operation Chakra 2 against organized cyber crimes? So, first of all, what is cyber crime? Let's try to build the awareness. So, it is a kind of unsolicited or unlawful act which is centered around the cyber infrastructure. Now, this will include your computer devices, the computer networks, or even some communication devices like your mobile phones. So, this is basically what stands for cyber crime. Now, what is the gravity of cyber crime in India? So, it has been highlighted by a Lok Sabha report that the number of cyber security incidents have exponentially risen across the decade. So you can see that in the year 2020, we can see 11 lakh, in total 11 lakh cyber crime incidents in India. Not only that, in the year 2022, it has been seen that about 13.9 lakh incidences have been reported around cyber crimes. And it has been also highlighted by a report of Cloudfare that it had submitted in 2022 that about 83% of the total organizations, including both public organization and private organizations, have been infected at least once by the cyber crime or cyber fraud. So once we understand the gravity of the cyber crime, how do we make sure that we have not been cyber attacked or how do we make sure that there is a cyber attack going on around us? For that, we need to understand the various types of cyber attacks. Now, cyber attacks can be broadly divided into two parts depending on whether the computer has been targeted or whether the computer has been used as a means to pursue the end goal of say stalking, bullying or terrorism or any other activity. So on the basis of these two classifications, cyber crimes can be as follows. First of all, the one which is targeting the computers. Now, computers can be targeted in two forms. Either in the physical form, the physical infrastructure can be targeted like the critical infrastructure, like the computers, like the USB drives. At the same time, softwares can also be attacked. So, what are the different types of cyber attacks in the field of software? First of all is the attack by virus. Virus is a malicious program which duplicates itself when it enters into a system and it corrupts the file, it infects the file and it also damages the file in many cases. So this is virus attack. The second is the worm attack. Worm attack is basically when a malicious program has entered and it is completely repeating itself on and on till it degrades the performance of the software. The third one is the Trojan horse attack or the Trojans attack. Now you need to understand the difference between virus and a, trojan, and a trojan because a trojan is not a virus. See, trojan horses are those destructive programs which do not duplicate themselves. Rather, they hack into the computer and they take access of the personal information. They take access of the passwords, the hidden information and then they have malicious, the, the hacker tries to have malicious use of such information. That is the Trojan horse attack. The second one is the ransomware. As the name suggests, a malicious software has been introduced into your system in order to corrupt the data, in order to take away the data and ask for a hefty ransom in return to the victim. So that is a ransomware attack. Next is the spyware attack. A classic attack was seen 
in the form of Pegasus across the world. Pegasus spyware attack where malicious program is inflicted onto a computer in order to take away the important information in order to conduct espionage activities. So this is spyware. Next, a type of software which is known as bots. Bots are basically the human agents that are impersonating human forms are also considered for or by the cyber hackers. So what do they do? They install the bots into your computer and then they do two kind of things. First, to have denial of service. So the first kind of attack is known as the DOS or the denial of service where the services or your access to your own software, your own online services, your own hardware is restricted because of the introduction of this mal malware. That is, that is the first one, the denial of service. The second is distributed denial of service. Here in particular, the online access or the online services of a user is hindered or restricted by the introduction of a malware. So in these two ways, the bots or the human agents or the software agents that are impersonating the humans can also introduce cyber frauds into the system. Now, as a result of this, they can either perform data theft, crypto theft, or any financial theft as well. The next kind of attack is when someone is trying to have a lot of checks and balances, trials and errors in order to enter or decode your software, in order to decode your password. And by decoding the password or any encrypted keys, he's trying to enter into the personal information. So this kind of trial and error method, the ruthless simulation of trial and error in order to decode the passwords is known as the brute force attack. This is also a kind of cyber fraud. Next is the physical attacks. The first one would be USB dropping. So these cases have been seen of late where the USB devices have been used as a source in the public places. For example, in the public places, there must be some charger, some charging points or some other USB cables which are thrown here and there. People will be picking them up, connecting their devices. And the moment they connect their devices with this USB, this USB transfers the malware into their devices and hence hijacks or corrupts the device. So this is USB dropping. This is used by hacker in the public places like airports or like your railway stations. Second one would be impersonation. Impersonation by a, by a human to appear as a cyber security agent or a financial agent and he is trying to provide you services while trying to garner some data or information from you which will eventually lead him to hack your financial deposits. So this is another kind of attack. Now, how can computers be used? The second side of the story, how can computers be used? So computers can be used for cyber stalking. What is stalking? To continuously monitor or continuously try to get the information or contact of someone despite her or his unwillingness. So that is cyber stalking. Then cyber bullying, which is a form of cyber harassment. Then performing social engineering. Now, what is social engineering? Here, the human psychology, psychology of trust and fears are exploited by the hackers in order to gain the data, in order to gain personal information or any financial information. So for this, phishing, wishing and smishing are some of the tools. So when emails are used, when fraud emails are used, when fraud links are sent to the emails, and when you click that email, when you click that link, it installs the malware, it installs the virus automatically into your account. That is known as a phishing attack. Next one is a wishing attack when you have been phone called by an agent and the agent is asking you to provide you a SIM card information in order to uh, have your loan transactions or in order to provide you any other service, then that is called a wishing attack. Next is a smishing attack when a SMS is sent to your mobile phone, a link is given in the SMS. The moment you click onto that message, your device gets infected. These are some kinds of social engineering attacks. Now, what are the purposes of all these attacks? Two things. First of all, to have data theft, to have identity theft of a person. For example, the recent attack on Aadhaar portal and on the UIDAI website, which 
tried to take away the information of lakhs and crores of indians so that was one such data theft or identity theft attack the second is to attack a public data bank for example any repository for example a bank say sbi and it serve it has got its server and the servers are attacked then a lot of public data gets outside and gets leaked so this is a public data attack next would be to attack the critical infrastructure of the country critical infrastructure which are very important for securing the sovereignty security and also the economy of the country which will include your defense architecture nuclear power plants the discoms the transportation lines etc so when you attack the critical infrastructure through electronic devices that is also another form of cyber attack so once we have understood what are the cyber attacks what are the different types of attack and whether we have been attacked or not what are the measures that we need to take now there are some government initiatives which facilitate the number of measures that we can take first and foremost we need to go and register an online complaint in a portal that is given by central government by the ministry of electronics and this portal is national cyber crime reporting portal of india so first and foremost action should be to reach out to this portal second the primary law which caters with the cyber law and the e-commerce in india is the it act the information technology act of 2000 now this act although it needs a lot of amendments in line with the growing digital revolution uh, but at the same time this act legalizes a lot of actions that is taken by the government to protect us against the cyber crimes next is a very comprehensive policy which gives us the guidelines and the vision to secure the cyber space of the country and this policy was launched in 2013 the name is national cyber security policy not only that government also has got some institutional mechanisms set up in order to protect the cyber space of india what are these so first and foremost is the formation of a nodal agency which is known as cert in this was formed in 2004 this is the very same year when the budapest convention that we are going to talk about that was also launched so cert in is a nodal agency against any cyber security related incidents in india The second is a user friendly portal known as Cyber Swachh Kendra. So you can visit this website which is created by METI that is the Ministry of Electronics and it was launched in 2017. Yes, you can visit the website of METI this particular Cyber Swachh Kendra and here you can perform bot cleaning. So if in case your computer or your software has been infected by any malicious bot gets cleaned using the Cyber Swachh Kendra. next is indian cyber crime coordination center now one issue with the cyber policy of india is the multiplicity of organization institutions and interventions of several ministries what will enable the coordination what will enable the transfer of information and the research and development across each other there needs to be a coordination center and that is i4c which is under ministry of home affairs very important from prelims point of view we also need to build awareness across cyber frauds because a lot many times people are not even aware that they have been they have been attacked by a cyber fraud so for that government of india has raised awareness using cyber surakshit bharat abhiyan which is also increasing the capacity of the security personnel of the government employees so that they also get aware and ready against the cyber attacks these are the government initiatives but then what are the other way forwards or winning strategies that india needs to perform if it wants to become cyber clean so the first one would be to build the capacity see the scenario is such that india has a second largest number of internet users across the world making us very very vulnerable but at the same time the amount of specialist or the cyber security professionals that we have in it, in the country is at a glaring condition so we have got negligible specialists and we have got a lot many users increasing the vulnerability perception of india therefore it is required that we raise an army of cyber security professionals by giving them training by performing human resource development by also upskilling them against many other advances in the it industry that is the 5g technology the internet of things 
the blockchain technology which is also enabling the transfer of cryptocurrency which is a hot mine of cyber frauds also artificial intelligence also data analytics the big data etc so because these technologies are evolving we also need to upgrade the existing knowledge of our working professionals the second requirement is to promote investment in the research and development in the particular field in the field of cyber crime when we can see that there are growing complexities there is growing rate of cyber crime we also need to grow or ramp up our investments in r&d and also need to make sure that r&d performed across different institutions in the country needs to be coordinated so that their information can collaborate their information can converge and we can make the best use of our existing resources and knowledge next we need international cooperation international cooperation is a must is a very critical measure to be taken right now because cyber attack is no longer restricted to one jurisdiction cyber attack in one country could have got an origin from the other country so therefore inter country cooperation is also required and for this one suggestion would be for india to join the budapest convention this budapest convention is joined by many countries to promote their cooperation against cyber crime and also to harmonize create standards which harmonize the national laws across the world so india also needs to join this next is to have robust law enforcement mechanism their coordination and implementation why because the existing cyber security scenario of india is at a glaring condition we have got ad hoc mechanisms on the basis of emergencies that we are seeing also we have got uncoordinated mechanisms uncoordinated policies uncoordinated organizations which are working in a very haphazard manner as a result of this convergence and coordination is lacking which is the need of the hour so we need to ensure not only good law enforcement mechanisms are there but also that they are implemented properly and also that convergence and coordination is also enforced next last but not the least we need to ensure the protection of the critical infrastructure of the country in the kudankulam nuclear power plant a malware attack was seen similarly in 2019 there were attacks seen on mumbai discom on jaipur discom so as a result of this the overall attack on the critical infrastructure which can threaten the security of the country because here underlies the very crucial data of the country it also has a multiplier effect in the economy for example the transport sector the nuclear sector so therefore we need to safeguard the critical infrastructure and do we have any measure regarding this existing in place yes we have that is national critical information infra protection center is already there but we need to provide more teeth to it so that it can enable the cyber security in india effectively and efficiently coming to the next topic here we will read about the corruption scenario in india what is the context that pending prosecutions against 118 cases against the public servants have been flagged by the department of personnel and training it caters to gs2 and gs4 part of the syllabus where we also read about ethics and common causes of corruption and their prevention measures in india so to begin with what do we mean by corruption to give you a clearer understanding let me tell you that corruption derives its origin from the greek word corruptus corruptus means to break or to destroy what are we breaking we are breaking the expected code of conduct or we are breaking the ethics that is expected out of a person who is in the power according to the definition of world bank corruption can be defined as the misuse or the abuse of the political power in order to harness the personal gains now why is a person in power misusing their position misusing their authority that definition is given by the second arc report it highlights that when a person has got a lot of monopoly along with a lot of discretion in hand and is also given a lot of secrecy without accountability then that person who is in power is very likely to perform corruption so this is the definition given by the second arc report
what is the perception of corruption in india so india ranks very low when it comes to corruption it ranks 85 on 180 countries far below its own neighbors so therefore the rate of corruption is very high in india what are the reasons of high corruption in india so first of all the legacy issues since the historic times we have been exploited by our colonial predecessors and therefore there was rampant poverty when india gained the independence and that was augmented by a lot of mal practices that were brought forward by the administration during the colonial era so there corruption was a norm corruption was a luxury it was not something that was problematic and that got carried forward in the independent india so here when the discretionary powers in the monopoly got enhanced by the mr tp act which basically empowered the license raj in the country this was pre liberalization practice that's when the legacy of the corruption got entrenched deep into the system of india next is reasons of political system see when a political party wants to contest election it will be taking a lot of money and that too it will be garnering a lot of black money into the system that too spent in the election in order to win ruthlessly now once it has came into power it would like to recover all of this money so therefore it will find doing corruption as a norm as a very natural tendency as against all the expenditure that they have made in the political campaigning next is this gets augmented by the lack of transparent election funding mechanisms in india as a result of this the use of black money gets easier in india and next is the criminalization of a politics you cannot expect a law breaker to eventually become a law maker the casualty will be the falter in rule of law so therefore criminalization and the heavy criminalization in indian politics is one of the reasons why we are seeing high cases of corruption next is economic structure we have got low formalization of the indian economy less than 10% of the population is within the formal structure therefore it is very difficult to gauge them to track them to track their tax evasions and then second there is large wealth inequality or the economic disparity the income disparity that takes place in india as highlighted by a report of transparency international the amount of wealth disparity or income disparity is directly proportional with the levels of corruption that that can be seen in a country so therefore economic structures that are prevailing in india are one of the sources of corruption themselves next is some of the legal lacunas now we have got ipc and crpc these are archaic laws which are not conducive of the current challenges of administration and the current changes in the forms of corruption so we have got outdated laws the existing laws which are there the existing institutions for example there is lokpal there is lok ayog there is cvc there is cic there is loopholes in their autonomy as well because there is political interference in their appointments and their transfers which also does away with their efficiency and second even if there are legal provisions legal safeguards which ensures sunshine or transparency into the system for example rti still there are various measures within it various provisions which have got even actually diluted so these are the legal lacuna next are the judicial delays this is the lack of protection of the good samaritans people who report the corruption people who forbid doing the corruption and also lack of whistle blowers next targeting the upright officials which degrades the moral fabric of the society next delay in the prosecution as highlighted by this particular case also that the people who should have been duly prosecuted have not been done so so far so about 130 cases have been pending in the indian courts next is the social problem the biggest problem is our mindset that we do not consider corruption as a problem anymore rather we consider as a norm this mindset needs to be changed next is the growing feeling of consumerism that anything can be brought with the help of money through fair means or illegal means then there is failures in the moral education especially the education that is given in the higher higher education system or in the senior secondary where it is not being taught how to perform ethical governance how to perform ethical code of conduct 
Now, when we have read about that, let's also understand the impacts of corruption on Indian economy, demography and society overall. So, first of all, it hampers the development process. There are various methods through which corruption can be, con can be conducted. One would be through embezzlement of funds. There can be siphoning of the taxes, evasion of taxes. There can be demand of bribery. There can be nepotism and appointment. So, these are some of the methods through which corruption can be done. Largely, siphoning of the funds that can be utilized in development of infrastructure in India that is now used to feed off the private pockets of some powerful people. So, it diverts the funds as a result of this. The development prospect of the country gets compromised. We are not able to build the roads that could have been built. Next, it also compromises with some of the policies and schemes which are there to perform the social and economic equity in India. For example, the PDS scheme, for example, some education sector schemes or healthcare sector schemes. Now, because there is widespread corruption in these schemes, siphoning of the funds, therefore, the demographic performance of the country also goes down. We are also seeing huge forms of hunger now, poverty now. Why? Because the funds that have been allocated to these schemes have not been effectively utilized. Next is, what is the impact of economy? Now, naturally, when the corruption perception of a country goes up, the foreign investment goes down. As a result of this, the ease of doing business also goes down. Why ease of doing business is going down? Because of the prevalent red tapeism. Not only that, it also causes hindrances to the businesses. Now, all these factors, because your business is not working, FDI is not coming, therefore, the economy growth will also be tampered. Next is, what is the impact on economy? When such cases of corruption are going on, there is a widespread case of mistrust among the people through the by the government officials. And as a result of this, a lot of conflicts can be seen. These conflicts eventually get aggravated in the form of separatist movement, in the form of nexalist movement. Why? Because they have been disappointed by the ongoing corruption. Next, it also widens the economic gap within the society because of the siphoning of the funds, wrongful diversion of the funds. Now, because there is enhanced economic gap, that is the rich is getting richer, the poor is getting poorer, there is further aggravation of corruption. Because the powerful is getting more powerful, more likely to misuse his power. And as a result of this, the poverty cycle will become perpetual in a country like India. So in order to safeguard against the menace of corruption, what are the legal frameworks in place? This you can use in your mains answer writing also. There are certain laws and there are certain regulatory bodies. The laws are Prevention of Corruption Act of 1988. A question on this has been asked by UPSC prelims. The Companies Act, which has got some provisions to protect against the company corruption. Next, the Foreign Contribution and Regulation Act. And there are some regulatory bodies like Lokpa, Lokayukt, CVC, CIC, etc. in order to enforce mechanisms to curb corruption. But then what really needs to be done? What is the way forward? The way forward as recommended by the Nolan Committee and by the second ARC report goes like this. First of all, we need to ensure the building up of ethical conduct among the public servants. This can be done by following the seven ethical and moral values that are given by the Nolan Committee report in 1995 in UK, United Kingdoms. So what are these values? Some of them are openness, building selflessness, honesty, integrity, objectivity, accountability, leadership. So these values needs to be reinforced and retaught to the civil servant. Next is to have electoral reforms. We need to put some stop in the expenditure limits of the political parties so that they do not have black money or illicit transfer of money in the election systems, which eventually leads to corruption. We also need to make sure that state funding is made a reality now. And also we need to empower the election commission so that it can legalize the model code of conduct, which can do away with practices like use of black money and unnecessary expenditure on election. Next, 
to strengthen the existing institutions. For example, more protection needs to be given to our whistleblowers. We also need to have more autonomy given to institutes like Central Vigilance Commission, like CBI. They can also be, we can also consider about giving them a legal status or more prominent status like that of a constitutional one. So constitutional status can also be given them so that more teeth can be given to them. Next, some administrative reforms needs to be there in order to politically isolate the civil services from unnecessary interference civil services board is one of the recommendations given by second arc that we need to create this organization second regular sensitivity training of the civil servants also needs to be done next we need to perform preventive vigilance in the form of community policing in the form of social auditing. So these measures can be taken in order to check the performance and the prom promises that were delivered by the civil servant or delivered by the policy and review the overall performance. Next is to develop code of ethics for the civil servants and make it mandatory to be followed. Next, as suggested by second ARC, that one of the main reasons of corruption is the high discretion that is given to the public servants. So we need to reduce the discretion for that. Clear standard operating procedures needs to be put in place. Next, we also need to minimize the human interference into the system. Therefore, we need to now shift to e-governance. We need to shift to use of technology. And e nam project is a very welcoming step in this direction. Next, social sector improvement. We need to enhance the citizen awareness by first of all giving them citizen charters. We need to also educate our children about the ethical conduct using the curriculums that are there in their courses. Social audit needs to be used and also one very important way forward is to establish Rights to Services Act. Now, Right to Services Act is that which ensures and guarantees that you will be provided government service without giving off any bribe. So, a welcoming step in this direction is Rajasthan's Social Accountability Bill. So, by following all these measures, we can make sure that India becomes a corruption-free nation. Coming to the third topic, now we are going to talk about the nanoparticle pollution. So ahead of the festivi festivities, the Diwali festivity, the air quality index in prominent cities like Mumbai and Delhi have fallen down. And as a result of this, this has flagged concern regarding air pollution and has also brought in the case of nanoparticle pollution. What are nanoparticles and what are the health impact? This deals with GST part of the syllabus. So first of all, let's understand why is this topic important? Because this has been asked by UPSC in the prelims examination. The question was asked that there is some concern regarding nanoparticles. So what are these? The first one, they can accumulate in the environment and contaminate water and soil. They can enter the food chains. They can trigger the production of free radicals. What is the correct answer? The correct answer is all of them. So when a nanoparticle is able to do all of these things, it is also able to do air pollution at a very vast rate and also able to impact the health of a person. So what are nanoparticles? Nanoparticles are able to create a lot many menace first because of its size it has got very very small size ranging from 1 to 100 nanometers nanometer is of a scale of 10 raised to the power 9 meters first of all because it has got very small size it has also got huge mobility it can get suspended it can remain suspended in the atmosphere for a long period of time and it can also ensure long distance travel Therefore, it is very difficult to control and then to curb the menace of nanopollution. Not only that, the current regulations that are there in place, for example, the Air Act, the Environment Protection Act, etc., they only talk about at maximum the particulate matter 2.5 and 10. They are not talking about nanoparticles. So, they are also effectively out of the existing regulatory mechanisms. Next, it is very difficult to track the exact source of nanoparticles because they are very, very small, very predominantly available. So there can be natural sources like earthquakes. There can be artificial sources like manufacturing industries, vehicular emissions, etc. And these sources are very difficult to be pointed out. This creates the overall menace of the nanoparticle pollution.
What are the exact causes? To briefly summarize it, first is the vehicular emission because it utilizes the fossil fuels. So the internal combustion engines and vehicle exhaust are a source of nanoparticles. Next is the industrial processes where it again utilizes fossil fuels in the power plants, in your factories and again another manufacturing industries. Now, as a result of this, it also gets harnessed into the medical domain, in the medical industry also. So, while we are using some of the solvents, some of the chemical reactions also emit the medical or the nanoparticle pollution, then some pharma products, for example, face washes or other chemical products are also capable of producing nanoparticles. Then there are some ur urban activities, for example, there is high pollution because of high traffic density. There is also high level of industrial operations going on in urban areas, which has created urban areas as the hotspot of nanoparticle pollution. Then there are vehicles exhaust, there is tire wear, there is road abrasion. So even from these sources, we can get nanoparticle pollution. Then there is indoor pollution coming from cooking, smoking, even using your scent and your perfumes, which have aerosols in them. Then there are natural processes, for example, volcanic eruption, which erupts the volcanic ash or sulfurs or soots into the atmosphere, which also has got some nanoparticle in it. Also forest fires, also sea sprays. So these are some of the natural causations of nanoparticle pollution. Now, what is the health impact? Because this article particularly deals with the health impact, we'll be dealing with its health impact on respiratory health and on the brain health. So what happens? Because of the very, very small size, it is able to particularly infiltrate the immune system. The immune system is not able to capture the nanoparticle, hence not able to consider it as a virus. Hence, it is not able to create an immunity defense against it. Now, as a result of this, it is able to bypass the natural defense mechanisms, creating many many oxidative stresses in the body as a result of this it creates cancer responses it creates cell damages it triggers inflammation in the body and it particularly aggravates the health condition of the people already suffering from respiratory disease like asthma now what about the brain health so whatever we are consuming essentially goes through the transport lane which is the blood in order to safeguard our brain from the blood there is a protective layer. This protective layer is permeable, but it has got micro cells in it. As a result of this, a lot many pollutants, except for the vitamins, these are not able to penetrate inside the blood or inside the, inside the brain part. Now, when we understand this, what happens with nanoparticles, because of the very, very small size, they are able to cross this barrier. Now, when they are able to cross this barrier, they eventually lead to impairment in the brain health, impairment in the cognitive health. So, they lead to neurodegenerative diseases, neuroinflammation, for example, Parkinson's uh, disease, Alzheimer disease. So, these are some of the impacts of nanoparticle pollution. What to do about them, that we will read maybe in some another lecture. Now, coming to the fourth one, we will talk about a place in news which is in global spotlight. This is Rafa crossing. Now, Rafa border crossing in the southern Gaza has gained spotlight as Palestinians are attempting to leave Gaza in anticipation of a possible Israeli attack. So, what is this Rafa crossing? Now, in our lecture of 16th October, we read in depth about the Gaza Strip. Now, let's revisit the Gaza Strip. When we read about it, see this is Gaza Strip, it shares border with Mediterranean Sea, with Egypt and with Israel. Now, the Gaza is currently under a blockade. It is occupied by the Palestinian people. The power that is their political power is Hamas. We have already read about this. And basically, this is under the blockade of Israel. So, Israel only permits the transfer of some of the goods services and some of the human resources here and there but the entire border is captured by israel now what is happening in the current scenario it has only been given three exit point by israel through which it can transfer its goods and services so it is eris crossing it is rafa crossing and it is kerem shalom goods crossing
Now, as you can observe from this map, it is very clear that both Erez Crossing and Kerem Shalom is directly under the jurisdiction of Israel. On the other hand, it is only Rafa Crossing, which is it is only Rafa Crossing, which has got its jurisdiction in the Sinai Peninsula, which is eventually under Egypt. So therefore, a lot of movement across the Rafa crossing is taking place. The another significance is that Israel has already closed passing of goods from Erez crossing and Kerem Shalom. So people are only left with one alternative and that is Rafa crossing. So the, all the humanitarian aid through the Sinai Peninsula is now getting into Israel through this particular crossing. What is Sinai Peninsula? Sinai Peninsula is under Egypt's jurisdiction. This is a triangular peninsula which has got a lot of significance, strategic significance because about 12% of the total trade takes place through a canal which passes through Sinai Peninsula. This is Suez Canal and through Suez Canal passes the 12% of the total global trade of the world. Not only that, it also forms the shortest route between Europe and Asia. So therefore, these routes become very important. Now what happened? In the year 1967, a 60 war broke out between Israel and the Arab countries. Israel won eventually and Israel tried to take up some of the occupations. For example, Golan Heights was taken from Syria. West Bank was taken. Then there was Gaza Strip, which was taken up. Then there was Sinai Peninsula, which was taken up from Egypt. Now what happened in 1979, a peace treaty was conducted between Egypt and Israel. As a result of this, Israel said that we will give the Sinai Peninsula back to you. So now the Sinai Peninsula is under Egypt jurisdiction only. And from, 18, from 1982, Sinai Peninsula is considered as an independent jurisdiction of Egypt. So this was about Rafa crossing and also Sinai Peninsula. Coming to the last topic, here we will read about the first ever rapid X train or the regional rapid transport system that is to be launched today. So India's first RRTS train which is named as Namu Bharat will be flagged in NCR region today. So what is this train about and what is this project about? So, this is a mass transit system which is basically nothing but a high speed rail connectivity which is focused at decongesting the NCR region. So, it is aimed at having balanced and sustainable urban development. Why? Because we can see that rapid urbanization is going on in the NCR region. It is expanding more than ever. Now, as a result of this, the population density is also going up. Because population density is going up, the requirement of vehicles is going up. Vehicles is going up, narrow lanes are there, traffic congestion and traffic jams can be seen every now and then. So congestion is also going up. Now, in order to decongest the urban cities, for example, the NCR region, such systems are conducted or created, which are at a mediation point between railways and metros. So they are not as fast as Indian railways, they are faster than the metros definitely. But when it comes to the frequency, the number of trains that will be passed, the frequency of the RRTS system will be more than that of Indian railways, less than that of metros. Okay. Now, what is it about and where is it operant? It is currently operant in the phase one. In the, the phase one is in the 17 kilometer priority stretch of the Delhi, Ghaziabad and Meerut zone. So you can see over here and this entire system is going to be operational by year 2025. What is the evolution of the RRTS? Where is this idea germinating from? So it originated from a study conducted by Indian Railways in 1989 to decongest the urban cities of India efficiently. Now this particular report was again reviewed by the planning board of NCR which recommended eight corridors in total, which needs to be implemented in two phases. So these eight corridors, here, here are the eight corridors that you can see, are spread across the NCR region, basically the four states of India, that is Rajasthan, Haryana, UP and Delhi. So hence, the first phase has been started taking up and the first phase and that too in the priority stretch of it which only includes five stations that has been or is going to be inaugurated today. 
Now, who has built this particular train? This has been built by the Transport Corporation of the NCR region, which is a joint venture between Rajasthan government, Haryana government, Delhi government and your UP government. How is it different from metros? Before understanding that, let's quickly analyze the features. So, the train is designed at a speed of 180 kilometers per hour. So, in 60 minutes, you would be able to cover 180 kilometers. What about Indian metros? Indian metros at maximum, at the best efficiency, travel at around 100 kilometers per hour. So, definitely it is more faster than the Indian metros but less faster than the Indian railways. They are more comfortable because the coaches are AC designed and are better and more comfortable as compared to Indian railways. Secondly, they also enable traveling longer distances in shorter time because the connectivity of metro though is faster but is shorter. This is not in the case of RRTS. So, these were the features that we needed to read about Namo Bharat. On this note, I'll end the session. Thank you so much. Have a nice day.